And now it is my pleasure to welcome Eddie Robinson of Houston Public Media, who will have the honor of introducing tonight's presenter. Eddie Robinson currently works as executive producer and talk show host for a new weekly broadcast show and podcast that will premiere this spring on KUHF 88.7 FM called ICU. This show is part of Houston's public media's mission to expand more of its programming related to initiatives centered around diversity, equity, and inclusion. In addition to his mechanical engineer background from Prairie View a and as well as journalism masters from New York University, Eddie has worked in a plethora of broadcast media companies as an air host, writer, and producer, including just some, CBS News, CBS Radio, CNN's New York One, MTV's networks, and Sirius XM satellite radio. Eddie, welcome. Yes, thank you so much for that intro, and I'm so grateful to see all of you and be with you this afternoon. And, you know, it's indeed a pleasure to welcome and introduce you to the author of the biography of the first black woman to be elected vice president of the United States of America. And it's an exciting time in our country to be alive and, and witness history in the making, seeing a person of color, seeing a woman of color as vice president of our nation. Now, that's a powerful visual. And shout out to Michael Blunk, who's with our Houston Public Media Corporate Relations and Partnerships Group. Uh, Michael's the one who reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in being a part of the event. I'm like, yes, absolutely, of course. And this is a perfect opportunity to introduce this renowned journalist and author, of course. So it's an exciting time for our station at Houston Public Media as well, because we're seeing the power of fostering this idea of creating programming related to initiatives centered around diversity, equity, and in my mind, and most importantly, inclusion. We sometimes forget to understand what that word truly means, right? And that's why Houston Public Media tapped me to be this talk show host and executive producer of this new show called ICU. It's premiering May 15th on Saturdays at 1 p.m. on Houston Public Media, our NPR station here in Houston. And as executive producer, it'll focus on helping us understand who we all are as individuals so that we can learn more about how to live and work together as a community, those notions of identity, those notions of our heritage, those notions of inclusion really come into focus. So we're hoping that listeners walk away with a sense of self-discovery. So expect conversations from newsmakers, filmmakers, musicians, historians. We'll use music and audio to tell those stories and narratives, a unique space. So it's called I See You. And hopefully at some point in the future, we can have this remarkable journalist that I'm about to introduce you to as a guest on I See You as well. He's worked for the Los Angeles Times for 27 years, covering the California Supreme Court, the California State Legislature, the governor's office. He was also a columnist and editorial page editor of the Sacramento Bee from the years 2010 to 2018, so about eight years, when he became senior editor for the nonprofit news site calmatters.org. Now, he stepped down from that position in 2020, and his recent work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Kaiser Health News, and CNN. And uh, he's been covering Kamala Harris for years, since 1994, including both her campaigns for Attorney General and U.S. Senator. A veteran journalist covering policy, politics, and justice-related issues. Everyone, on behalf of the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston, please join me in helping me welcome Dan Moraine. Well, thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Eddie. It's our pleasure to have such great friends at Houston Public Media, and thank you, Sandia, for the introduction. Um, Dan, we're so excited you can join us today, and uh, we have uh, a lot of interest in this program, so I know that we're going to get a lot of questions. Um, I want to make sure that every question gets answered on this program today. So if you would like, go ahead and start submitting them now and we'll get them worked into our program. But tonight we are going to take a historical look 
at how the daughter of immigrants in California becomes a woman who has risen to be the 49th vice president of the United States. And in doing so, the first female vice president, the first African-American vice president, the first Asian American vice president, and the highest ranking female official in US history all encompassed in an amazing story that Dan has put together called Kamala's Way, An American Life. So Dan, you've covered California politics for decades and you covered her campaign as Eddie mentioned and now her, your most recent work, Kamala's Way. What was so intriguing about Kamala that compelled you to write this book? Well, you, you know, like, like so many reporters I've, I've seen uh, you know, really interesting politicians come and go. Uh, California has produced um, um, some fascinating people. Pete Wilson was really the first governor who I paid a lot of attention to. Before that, George Duke Mason a little bit. Jerry Brown, of course. Um, you know, Kamala Harris is, is, is um, um, you know, and, the, and they were all very talented politicians and, and, and thoughtful uh, people. Kamala Harris is a... a, a is, is all that. She's thoughtful, she's smart, she's tough, she's charismatic. Um, she also had really good timing, <laughs> you know? Um, so, so certainly Jerry Brown could have been president. He ran multiple times. Pete Wilson ran for president. Um, uh, uh, you know, she, she, uh, she has that certain something and that, that's part of the reason for the title, uh, Kamala's Way. I mean, she's, she's got a way about her that, that um, uh, stands out. It does stand out and, and um, we'll talk about that way in just a minute, but um, growing up, she is, um, I think we're familiar with her heritage, an Indian mother, Jamaican father, um, but it's so apparent um, the strong influence her mother had in um, the formation of her as an individual, how she handles obstacles, challenges. Um, so she was born of these immigrant parents, went through a divorce, uh, her parents divorced, and then she went to college. Give us a sense of her upbringing. Mm -hmm. Well, so she was born in Oakland, raised in Berkeley until age 12. Her parents, as you said, split um, when she was five. Their divorce was final in 1972. Um, it, without a doubt, her mother is her greatest influence. Um, uh, her mom died in 2009. I never met her, but I know many people who, who do did know her. Um, and she clearly was a force. I mean, imagine she was 19 years old, 1959, uh, and uh, had graduated from four-year college in India and persuaded her father that, that um, uh, she should be able to come to Berkeley. Imagine a 19-year-old kid comes halfway around the world, lands in Berkeley, uh, becomes a research scientist of, of some renown, breast cancer researcher. Um, uh, she got passed over for a job in Berkeley and rather than sit around and brood, she got a job at McGill uh, up in Montreal, French speaking. And so she packed her two daughters off, uh, Kamala and Maya, and, uh, and there they were. Kamala, was, uh, Kamala Harris was 12 years old in Montreal, uh, went through high school there. Um, so uh, the, their father was engaged, was involved. He, he was a tenured professor of economics at Stanford University, so clearly an intellect. Um, uh, he writes about bringing them to his daughters to Jamaica so they understood their roots there. Um, uh, they also traveled to India to uh, meet uh, Shamala Gopalan's uh, uh, parents. Uh, and family in India. So, you know, she really is a multicultural person, um, uh, you know, not at all parochial. So that's all part of her upbringing. Growing up in the Bay Area for those first 12 years, I mean, think about it. It was the focus of the anti-war movement. The civil rights uh, movement was really strong there. Um, the Black Panther Party began in Oakland when she was a kid. Um, 
you know, so it was really, a, uh, there was really quite a swirl going on in Berkeley and in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, when she was a kid. So all this, all this was, was happening. She becomes really quite a transitional person living in a transitional time. Mm -hmm. You talked a little about that social activism and even as a baby and young child, her parents involved her in social concerns. I really enjoyed the book about even shaping her first words. Tell us a little bit about that story. Well, um, you know, it's it's a story that I guess has been, you know, some people have disputed. I mean, I have no idea. I wasn't there, but but uh, but the story, her family, the family lore is, is that uh, she was in a stroller and was uh, fussing and her mom asked her what she wanted and she said, freedom. Well, you know, who, who knows? I wasn't there. Kamala does, you know, Kamala, it's a story that is told in that family. Um, uh, but without a doubt, her parents were, were um, you know, not leaders in the civil rights movement, but they went to marches. I mean, lots of people did in, in um, uh, the mid and late 60s in, in Berkeley. Um, uh, clearly liberal uh, uh, folks. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that, that her mother um, understood and made clear was, was that in America, though she was... Uh, though uh, Shamala was was from India, that that Kamala Harris and Maya Harris would be viewed as black, and so she made sure that her daughters um, uh, understood the civil rights movement, um, uh, uh, understood uh, the the you know the situation that that black people found themselves in, find themselves in, uh, but in the sixties and seventies, um, so. You know, I, I think that that was some um, uh, really um, in smart of <laughs> Shamala to make to make clear that 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 although they were of Indian descent, they also were black, and and in America would be viewed as such. Yeah, I think that strong um, influence from her mother ma made that um, made her confidence really strong. And uh, so I, I want to fast forward a little bit um, through her childhood, which was very interesting. Um, she graduated from Howard University uh, and the University of California Hastings School of Law, then began her career in the Alameda County as, as an Alameda County District Attorney's Office before being recruited to the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and later to the City uh, Attorney of San Francisco. Um, and in 2003, she was elected to as DA of San Francisco and Attorney General of California in 2010. A very rich, robust career and then reelected again in 2014. Um, during this time, several influencers um, or several individuals were influencers in her career, helped shape her professional career. Um, who were some of those big influencers? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in addition to her mother, I mean, clearly Willie Brown was, uh, was very influential. She, uh, Willie Brown uh, is a Texan, grew up in, in Mineola, uh, left Mineola in, in, at age 17 um, and came out to San Francisco, uh, uh, is black, um, so he grew up in Jim Crow South, uh, came to San Francisco, uh, had an uncle who lived in San Francisco, and he became a uh, speaker of the California Assembly and, and mayor of San Francisco and really um, a, a true force in California, Northern California. Um, uh, he, had a, he and Kamala Harris had a relationship in uh, 1994 and five. He was influential without a doubt. Uh, uh, that was where she, I think, really uh, uh, came to learn uh, about politics. Um, but then there are others, people whose names, um, uh, you know, folks would, are, are not household names. I mean, Willie Brown is a household name, certainly in, in California. Um, but people like Mark Buell, who was her first fundraising chairman, uh, uh, Deb Mesolo, who, who, was, who was and still is part of her political team, uh, you know, folks who, who were in, involved in recruiting and encouraging women to run for office. Um, this, was, this, this has been a hallmark of Kamala Harris's 
uh, a career. Um, uh, she, she helped found organizations that encouraged women to get involved in politics. And to this day uh, uh, is, um, tries to be, um, uh, try, still tries to encourage women to, to run for office. This is an you know, important part of who she is. Um, give us a sense of some of the bigger issues that she tackled while in uh, California politics, her opposition of the death penalty, several others. Mm -hmm. Well, she is, she is your, your right, a, a, a moral opponent of capital punishment. Um, when she ran for district attorney, she made clear that she wasn't going to uh, bring uh, death penalty uh, cases against against anyone, no matter the crime they committed. And so she was sworn in in, in uh, uh, January of 2004, and uh, and then in April of 2004, uh, there was a horrible murder of a police officer uh, in San Francisco, and um, and. Uh, Within three days, she announced that she wasn't going to. That, that's a capital crime in California, most states that have the death penalty. Within three days, she announced that she wasn't going to bring capital ca charges against him. There was an incredible backlash against her over that. Um, uh, at the at the funeral of the officer, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein stood up and and basically denounced the decision not to seek the death penalty. So you know she, but she. She didn't relent. She didn't file a death penalty case when, uh, as district attorney in San Francisco. When she ran for attorney general, she made clear that she opposed the death penalty but would enforce the law. So she, uh, and, and the law was that there, that there is a death penalty in California. It hadn't been carried out since 2006, nonetheless it's on the books. Um, so she, she was true to that position. Her deputies defended the death penalty uh, uh, in uh, uh, the appellate courts. Um, some of the other big issues uh, that, that uh, mattered to her were, um, uh, you know, sentencing laws, um, uh, issues related to police reform. Uh, child, uh, uh, she, one of the reasons she became a prosecutor um, if I could step back just a little bit, one of her friends in Montreal had become a, a victim of abuse, and uh, and and she uh, uh, invited this friend of hers to come live with her, and she did. Um, later in the presidential campaign, Kamala Harris said that uh, uh, that that the experience of her friend was one of the inspirations, one of the reasons she, she became a prosecutor, um, basically to defend children, to defend people who really cannot defend themselves. Um, and, uh, and so child sex trafficking was, was one of the, the uh, issues that, that um, uh, became quite prominent when she was California Attorney General. In fact, one of the cases, uh, well, what, really a huge case, uh, uh, brought her to Texas, uh, uh, brought her deputies to Texas uh, to search uh, uh, the offices of, of the then owners of a website called backpage.com, which, uh, which was basically being used to traffic uh, uh, women, but also traffic minors. And that's really what she focused on. This is a big issue. Truancy was another issue that she cared about. Uh, it's an odd position to take if you're a prosecutor, but she pushed for a law that made um, uh, uh, that that could hold the parents of elementary school kids criminally liable if their if their kids were habitual truants. Um, she never uh, prosecuted anybody for that, but that was but it's a, against the law in California. It's a law still on the books uh, because of her. So there are others, gun control, uh, you know, gun safety. She's very, you know, she, like a lot of law enforcement people, she uh, uh, tries to figure out ways to get guns out of the hands of people who really shouldn't have them, people who are dangerous, so. Important issues that really matter um, across the entire U.S. And, and she was well thought of as a prosecutor, DA, attorney general, um, considered by many to be very kind and thoughtful but also some say she might've been a little difficult to work for. In, in your experience, what can you tell us about that? Well, you know, of course, as, as a 
reporter as an editorial writer. She, you know, she, I, I never personally saw that side of her. Um, I mean, she can be very tough. She, you know, don't get me wrong. You, you know, she, she can give very thoughtful answers to questions uh, that a reporter might pose or an editorial writer might pose. And she's really good at not answering questions. Uh, so I'm sure the Washington press corps is discovering this. Um, the, um, but she is, um, uh, yeah, she's, she's, she can be a tough boss. I mean, we, you know, we all saw it. Um, in, uh, we saw that side of her when she was in the U.S. Senate and questioning attorneys general uh, Jeff Sessions and, and Bill Barr and, and Brett Kavanaugh, Trump's, um, President Trump's um, nominee to the Supreme Court. I mean, she could be really tough in questions. And, and you know, I had more than one of her former staffers say, you know, what you, what you see in, that, in, in those settings they would experience as, as, as staffers. You know, she's not a yeller. She doesn't throw things. That's, that's not her style, but she can be very tough and very direct. You know, I, I can well imagine, I never saw her in court, but I can well imagine that she was pretty good before a jury and very good at cross-examination. And some of her staffers felt that way. So yeah, she could be tough to work with. There are former staffers of Kamala Harris. That's why she's effective. <laughs> you mentioned in your book, because I'm really interested in, in understanding her as the person, what drives her into public service, what motivates her. Um, you, you mentioned the random acts of kindness she's known for, making connections with people outside of the headlines. Um, one part therapist, one part social worker, one part um, and one the other half who really understands the law. Um, one uh, city attorney described her as an intelligent lawyer who had a heart and, who, and also who had compassion. Tell us about some of those experiences. Well, you know, it, it, it wasn't all that well known. I mean, you know, I'm not, I've never been an access journalist. I've never tried to become friends with people I write about. It makes it too complicated. So, so I, you know, in the, in the interactions that I had with Kamala Harris as a, as a reporter for the LA Times and an editorial writer for the Sacramento Bee, um, you know, I never sat down and had a personal conversation with her, um, you know, but, but in the course of reporting this book, um, uh, I ran across stories that, that were, um, kind of surprising to me because, you know, the impression I had of her was kind of a no-nonsense, straight-ahead, tough person, you know. I mean, she could be very charming and charismatic and all that sort of thing, but but really as, as somebody who didn't have a lot of time, did not have a lot of time to uh, for niceties. Um, you know, she's always been a woman in a hurry. Um, uh, but... <laughs> Along the way, I heard these stories about how she would um, uh, take time out of her day uh, to, uh, you know, if people were, were ill. Uh, um, you know, there's one story, for example. Um, she was district attorney in San Francisco. Um, a law school friend of hers uh, uh, had become friends with a neighbor of his who, who was, um, uh, you know, just a political volunteer, not, you know, not, uh, not a name anybody would know. Anyway, he called District Attorney Harris and said, you know, this, this woman, Naomi was her name, uh, is, is uh, you know, she's not going to be around all that much longer. And, and she worked on your campaign and, and was a big supporter. It'd be great if you could send her a note. Well, rather than do that, Kamala District Attorney Harris said, said, well, let's meet. And so they went to the uh, public hospital where this woman was was uh, staying, um, and they and the lawyer friend of Kamala's walked her to the um, walked her to the woman's room, and she sat there for twenty minutes, holding her hand, talking with her. A couple of days later, the woman died. Now, this you know nobody knew about that. The lawyer knew about that. Obviously, Naomi knew about it, but she's you know she she's gone. Um, uh, the lawyer posted it on Facebook after um, uh, President Trump uh, went after Kamala Harris as being, you know, mean and nasty, whatever it was he was calling her. Um, and uh, 
uh, and just point it out. You know, this is a side of Kamala Harris that, that maybe you don't know about. So anyway, I talked to the lawyer and he added a few additional details beyond what, what he wrote in his Facebook post. So it's these sorts of things that, that I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, it was just, it was a recurrent thing, a recurrent theme as I did interviews, I kept hearing these stories. It was kind of nice. Um, uh, you know, I didn't set out to, to write a hatchet job. I didn't set out to write a puff piece. You know, what I set out to do was to write a fair uh, and balanced um, uh, uh, story of, of who this woman is. And, uh, uh, and so this, you know, these sorts of stories, these instances of, of reaching out to people, um, you know, on the anniversaries, of, you know, a, a mom, whose daughter died at age, uh, as a teenager. Um, you know, she calls this woman, um, who's a friend of hers, but calls her on Mother's Day and birthdays. You know, these sorts of anniversaries that, that really matter, um, you know, that are hard days for anybody who's lost anybody. She, you know, she, she makes a point of reaching out. Anyway, I just think that that adds a, a, a dimension to this, you know, tough, woman in a hurry, you know, politician on the rise that, that um, you know, just helps fill in some blanks, who, who she is, what she, what she is about. Yeah, better describes her character. One of the um, details you write about in the book is the work that she did with Backpage. And, yeah. um, you know, she made a risky political decision to challenge an internet company and, um, in a state that really shaped the internet. <laughs> and um, she was challenging protect, um, protections provided by the Communications Decency Act. Um, she used her position here to elevate uh, the huge horrid issue of and business of human trafficking. So tell us about that in more detail. Um, sure. that, that was risky a little bit, but uh, yeah, tell well, us. Well, yeah, so the you know the Communications Decency Act is is in the news often. Um, uh, internet uh, providers uh, uh, use it, rely on it as the uh, as as um, uh, you know allows them to post uh, uh, details on their website, and not be responsible for for the content. Well, Backpage.com posted uh, classified ads that were basically. Um, well, she, you know, they described it as an online bordello. She was not so much interested in, in uh, adult prostitutes, but she was interested in protecting girls. And, um, and so the complaint that she brought, that her deputy brought, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is all built around, you know, the victims who were 13, 14, 15, 17. I mean, these are, you know, the, you know, by definition, they are not prostitutes, they are victims. And, uh, and so she, she brought this case. Um, it, 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 this was in 2016. Um, she was running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, the, the case, the, uh, the case got thrown out. Basically, the, the judge uh, declared, a judge in California declared that this was, um, preempted by federal law, the Communications Decency Act. Rather than leave it there, she had already been elected to the US Senate. She, she uh, authorized her deputy to, to refile the case as a money laundering case. And, and that ultimately got, got upheld. She was in the US Senate by the time the judge, um, a separate judge uh, uh, made that decision. And that case is uh, still pending in, in Sacramento. Uh, uh, and then meanwhile, this is kind of interesting. I mean, what, what then happened was, was the feds who really should have brought this case. This is, you know, uh, this is, the feds ultimately did bring a case, the U.S. Justice Department did bring a case and that, and that criminal case is pending in Phoenix. Um, and then in the, uh, you know, because of the work really that California did, uh, the case got elevated, the issue got elevated, and, and, and uh, President Trump ended up signing a, a, uh, an amendment. It's a you know, seemingly minor amendment, but it, it does open the way for uh, states to 
uh, file cases against uh, these sorts of purveyors of, of uh, uh, child trafficking. Um, so successors to Backpage uh, uh, have to be a little more careful now. And this is an issue that, that, she, uh, that she championed, that she uh, 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 shined light on, and, and, and I think really did have a effect on the national uh, uh, debate. Um, it, it definitely did. And so in 2017, she, uh, Vice President, then Vice President Biden, administers the oath of office to Kamala as California's 45th senator. Soon after, uh, Harris is swearing in um, to the Senate. She could not have been better time for herself and for the Democratic Party as a whole. Um, her role on the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, Homeland Security, Environment, Public Works, and Budget, um, she became a quickly became a front runner a responder, trying to hold the Democratic line against many, if not most, of the issues at the heart of the Trump agenda. So, DACA, Homeland Security, border, again, all important. Tell us your perspective of how this defined her tenure in the Senate and ultimately her run for the White House. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she's running for the U.S. Senate in, in 2016. Um, she assumes that Hillary Clinton's going to win. Um, most um, people who are paying attention to politics assumed Hillary Clinton was going to win. Um, and, and obviously she didn't. Um, so that night, election night, the night that, that uh, Donald Trump uh, uh, wins the presidency, um, Harris quickly tears up uh, you know, what, what would have been an optimistic speech planning to work with Hillary Clinton and uh, as president and rewrote it uh, really on the fly and, and turned it into a, f a, a fight speech. She's gonna fight uh, on behalf of California. She's gonna fight on behalf of Black Lives Matter. She's gonna fight on behalf of, of uh, people in this country without papers, um, uh, fight for uh, immigrants' rights. Um, and uh, and really does make clear that this is the, that that she's going to go to Washington to be part of the opposition and to try to lead the opposition to the extent she could, um, and that's what she does. I mean, she doesn't, you know, she she's in the U.S. Senate for not very long. Uh, Diane Feinstein is the senior senator. Um, uh, she um, uh, she gets involved in, in high profile hearings she she has um, uh, really uh, you know choice committee assignments um, you know gets on judiciary uh, uh, where so she's able to, to you know ask tough questions of of uh, Bill Barr and Brett Kavanaugh anyway she uses this as a platform um, uh, whether she knew on election night, 2016 that she was going to be running for president uh, four years later or not. Um, clearly, her staff thought that that this was a possibility, um, and and so she made the decision. She made the run. It didn't turn out well. You know, it was not. It was um, kind of a dysfunctional campaign. I was not on the on that presidential campaign trail, but from the reporting I did and the reading I did, it was it was quite apparent that that this campaign just didn't work, um, you know, it was um, uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so she pulled out, she pulled out uh, in, in December, 2019, um, before the Iowa caucus and, and importantly before the California primary, which was um, March of 2020, she would have lost the California primary. Um, and that would have been terribly embarrassing and, and also would have weakened her politically. Um, uh, it, it, if in any future run in California. So she pulled out uh, uh, wisely uh, before, she, uh, before she lost the caucus and the primary, so. We have a question from a student which ties into what you're just saying and also with my next question, which you've just um, touched on. So she announces her presidential campaign. Um, it starts with fairly good results. Um, the question is, why do you think it failed? And my question is, how do you why do you think it lost traction with Democratic voters? Well, you know, her theory, uh, the, the theory of the campaign was that she, she, she had to do well in South Carolina. You know, when you think of it, Democrats uh, 
uh, win the nomination by winning uh, votes in Southern states. Um, and she could never gain traction in South Carolina. Um, you know, uh, the, the, so South Carolina, obviously the Democratic Party um, uh, is, um, uh, the, you know, the black vote is really important for Democrats in South Carolina. She could never, she could never um, weaken Joe Biden's position there. It's it's why she went after him in that first debate over his position on on busing uh, for school desegregation. She, her goal was was um, uh, you know she wasn't running for second place. She was running to to win the nomination and to win the presidency. She doesn't run for second place. Um, so that's why she went after Biden in that first debate, and and it's why. Uh, it, and but it just she just it just didn't work out. She couldn't figure out what her lane was. She she couldn't differentiate herself from from Biden. She wasn't as liberal as as Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. I mean, this is a woman who's been a prosecutor for uh, you know the bulk of her adult life. So she so she's you know she. I mean, she's liberal without a doubt, but but she's not as far left as 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 some in the Democratic Party are. She she was a prosecutor. She put people in prison for long periods of time. You know that that hardens people. That makes them you know sort of see a different uh, a side of life that that many of us don't wish to see. Um, so uh, it, it was a, a dysfunctional campaign. Uh, campaign organization split between Baltimore for some reason uh, and San Francisco, which is where many of her consultants were, um, is infighting. You know, lots of people run for president once, twice, three times and uh, before they win, and most of them don't win. Uh, but it's not unusual for for um, a person who has national ambition and and national level skill to run and not do well the first time. Uh, my guess is, she, is when she runs again, and I have no doubt but that she will, that it'll be a, a, a smoother campaign operation. You touched on it briefly. We have a question from the audience. Stephen asks, do you think the mindset of many in the Republican Party that Kamala is far left is justified or not? Yeah, yeah you know, it, certainly not by California standards. Um, uh, you know, she, she, of, of course she's, she's a liberal, you know, she, she, um, uh, to her core believes in, in civil rights. Uh, uh, she would like to figure a way to, to limit assault weapons and make sure people undergo background checks before they get guns. Um, uh, she's, uh, uh, very supportive of, of, uh, women's health care and reproductive rights. Um, so yeah, if you, and same sex marriage, I mean, the, the, you know, these are, these are sort of fundamental issues in California. You, uh, you know, if you're a Democrat in California, you sort of, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying she, 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 she believes these issues without a doubt. Um, uh, but no, she's not a radical leftist. I mean, that's just silly. And, and on, on the flip side, on the flip side, um, you know, the progressives in the Democratic Party who, who called her Coppola, I mean, that's kind of silly too, right? I mean, she's not. She, um, she certainly put her share of people in prison. Uh, I'm not sure that's a bad thing if you're running in a general election. Uh, might not help in, in, in some Democratic primaries. Um, but, uh, but no, she's, she's um, you know, she's to the left. Uh, She's not as far left as, as, as Senator Warren or Senator Sanders. Um, uh, and, you know, she's not as far right as Senator Manchin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somewhere on there. So um, do you think her presidential campaign actually helped her in the long run, or do you think it will? And uh, maybe to get on Biden's radar, I'm mixing in a question from the audience. Um, uh, uh, do you think it helped her? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't think it, well, it clearly didn't hurt. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, she was already on Joe Biden's radar. She had a friendship with Bo Biden, his late son, Bo Biden. Uh, they were uh, 
attorneys general at the same time. They were allies, he in Delaware, she in California. They were allies in litigation against big banks over the mortgage meltdown uh, in, in 2011. Um, uh, and, uh, and then they were, they also, this is not part of the book, but, but they also uh, were allies on, um, uh, on gun safety related issues after the horrible massacre at Sandy Hook. They made joint appearances uh, um, uh, talking about the need for some sort of um, gun control effort. Um, so in um, 2016, when she was running for US Senate, uh, Joe Biden came out to California. It was a speech I covered uh, where he, he talked about, um, uh, it was a California Democratic Party convention. Um, he opened the speech by talking about Bo Biden's relationship with Kamala Harris. Bo had been dead for, uh, I think, less than a year then. Um, and, uh, and he talked about that when uh, he made the announcement that she was, his running mate, that that his that Bo Biden's uh, uh, friendship and respect and admiration for Kamala Harris mattered a lot to him, so she was already on Joe Biden's radar. Um, uh, you know, he made the decision, he made the announcement that he was going to he was going to choose a woman as his running mate. Well, so that that narrows the field by half, and then you know George Floyd died. Uh, under the knee of a Minneapolis cop. And, and that changed politics, certainly changed democratic politics. Um, and so it became imperative that I think that he was gonna pick a woman of color. And when you think about it, there were you know, not that many. <laughs> you know, Stacey Abrams clearly was in the mix uh, of Georgia. Um, uh, Susan Rice was in the mix. Um, Karen Bass, Congresswoman from California, uh, but really Kamala Harris was the only one who had run statewide and won. She had won California three times. That's not easy to do. Um, and she had run for president. So she had been vetted by, by um, journalists. She certainly had been vetted by opposition researchers uh, from both parties. Um, so Joe Biden knew what he, was, what he was getting in selecting Kamala Harris. So, um, so no, it didn't hurt her to run for uh, the presidency, um, uh, and you know, it, 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 because she has that experience. I think it it it, it probably helped. Um, you know, he knew that that she could, you know, hit the campaign trail. That she was pretty good on the stump. That she was, uh, you know, she could charm an audience. Um, so she also helped with fundraising quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we see uh, of her character kind of a, a youthful energy. We talked about her charisma, good politician, knows how to fit into a lot of different situations, some really good strengths that maybe we see um, of her as an individual. Uh, what would you define as some of her weaknesses? Mm -hmm. Well, she, she, uh, she doesn't take positions sometimes. She, uh, uh, you know, she ducks issues. I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily a weakness from her position, for, from her perspective. She, uh, she tends to uh, take positions when she wants to take them. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't, uh, she tries to, to um, you know, not fight other people's battles, but but really sort of pick and choose her battles, and that can be frustrating, certainly to reporters who cover her. Um, I you know I wrote you know several pieces about her in which I called her overly cautious, and um, you know she ought to take a stand on on um, you know various initiatives out in California. Um, so I found that frustrating as as a, as a journalist. Um, uh, weaknesses beyond that, um, you know, she, she can be, like I say, a tough boss. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably not a good thing. Um, she works really hard. She listens to advice. She knows that she doesn't know everything. Those are uh, on the plus side. Um, she's got empathy. She's got heart. I think that that matters, especially after the horrible year we all endured. Um, you know, 550,000 Americans dying because of COVID. Um, you know, it, 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 
you know, that sort of thing matters. I think it, it matters to, to President Biden too. Do you think those are some of the characteristics, well, I'm sure those are some of the characteristics that differentiated her from the other candidates, mm -hmm. um, Ambassador Susan Rice, Stacey Abrams. Why do you think he chose her over those two in particular? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, again, I think it has to do with, with having, having run nationally and, ha well, having, having won twice in California. Uh, and then having run nationally. Susan Rice obviously is a talented person, um, uh, you know, brilliant person. Um, she'd never run for office. Stacey Abrams, uh, clearly talented, uh, energetic uh, person who's got a huge future in front of her in democratic politics. Um, you know, she, she had it one statewide. Um, so, you know, I, just, I think it kind of comes down to to the, the experience. Um, it wasn't clear though, I mean, in, including up, up until the final weekend before Joe, before the Tuesday, I think it was August 11th when Biden picked um, Harris that it was going to be Harris. I mean, he kept it very, very quiet. Um, uh, there was a, a lot of speculation it was gonna be Susan Rice, um, but um, you know, ultimately I think he, he went with somebody who, who had a deep well of support in California, uh, uh, and uh, and had, you know, had been battle tested on the campaign trail. Though she didn't do well as a presidential candidate, she had one in California. A question from the audience: How do you describe both the personal and working relationship between Biden and Harris? Well, I, you know, I'm in California. I'm not covering the the Biden Harris. Um, administration. So, you know, it's tough for me to know. Um, uh, so, I, you know, it's just, I, I would, I would look at, at the people who are, who are writing it, writing uh, the story, uh, the ongoing story. I do notice, though, that she's always nearby, uh, that he's given her uh, high profile uh, 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 jobs. I mean, to, to, you know, to give her, to, to basically put her uh, overseeing um, uh, the Southern border. Uh, you know, clearly he's got to have, he's got to have confidence in her. He's making sure that, that, that she meets world leaders, that she's talking to world leaders, uh, Netanyahu, for example. Um, so that matters. Um, you know, <laughs> Nobody, Joe Biden would not pick Kamala Harris to be his vice president if he wanted a potted plant that he was going to shove off in a corner. I mean, that's not who she is. She's, she's a person who's, who's, who's thoughtful, who's got opinions, who's, who's um, smart, um, and who's got moves. She's got political moves. And, and she, you know, so, so of course he's going he's gonna to use that. He understands that, that, that this is a formidable person. Um, and, and, uh, and so he's, he's going to make the you know, best use of, of, of her skills. Um, do you have confidence she can fix the border issue? Um, no. I just handed that to her. No. Um, <laughs> no. Who's, who, you know, we have, <laughs> you know, America hasn't, uh, no, we haven't fixed the border issue. Uh, for, you know, it's, it's, it's been going on for decades. I, you know, I've been writing about this uh, uh, issue from, you know, back in the 1980s, right? So this is, this is an ongoing issue. Um, uh, you know, I do think that it makes sense to, uh, to engage with Guatemala and El Salvador, Honduras. Um, uh, you know, President Obrador has got to uh, help out here. Um, you know, the, it, so of course, you know, this is, this is, um, this, this is an issue that, that, uh, multiple administrations have not fixed and, uh, uh, you know, we have to figure out, it seems to me, we have to figure out, uh, uh, uh a sane way to deal with, with people who are here, who are, part of our community. I mean, there are, you know, two and a half million people living in California without papers. Um, uh, their children uh, are going to schools here. Um, 
uh, same in Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. I mean, we've been in Iowa and every other state, but you know, we've, we've got to figure out a way to deal with this in a humane way. I mean, I know George W. Bush certainly thought so. I think he still thinks so. I guess he's got a new book about that uh, issue, which uh, is on my reading list. Um, uh, so yeah, nobody's fixed it, I, uh, I, I hope. But she does have experience, right? This is you know, this, this is, a, you know, this is a, a, an ongoing and a really important issue in California. You know, Democrats in California, though, and independents in California do believe that there should be a, a pathway to citizenship for, for people living here without papers. Um, Republicans, not so much. It's a partisan issue. Um, I don't know how we're going to fix that. Question from uh, Laura, do you believe she will be our first woman president? And if so, what will she need from the Democratic side to gain full support? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's really hard to become president. We've only had 46 of them. Uh, it's, you know, uh, and, and, you know, she has, to, she has to win the nomination to begin with. Democrats don't coronate their, their uh their nominees, so there will be a fight, um, whether it's in four years or eight years or 12 years, whenever it is that, that, that she makes her serious run. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, do I think she could become president? Sure. Um, do I think she will become president? I, I, you know, I don't know. The Electoral College favors Republicans. Um, so, uh, you know, she has to figure a way to overcome that. Um, Republicans are going to, you know, Republicans are already running against her without a doubt. Um, uh, they know they're going to have to deal with her uh, on some level. I mean, that, but that's been going on since she ran the first time for California Attorney General back in 2010. Uh, back then, the Republican Party, uh, when it was super PAC, a Republican super PAC spent more than a million bucks uh, to try to defeat her. And uh, when she was running for California Attorney General um, and and elect, help elect the the republic her Republican opponent, um, and the reason was well they certainly would love to have a Republican Attorney General in California, um, uh, but but really they knew that Kamala Harris was was a rising star, uh, and that if she became Attorney General, uh, AG we all know that stands for aspiring governor she would have uh, she would have run for higher office governor senator um, you know interesting uh, something I didn't know at the time but found out in the course of reporting this book her opponent was um, a district attorney from Los Angeles far more experienced than she was uh, from a you know huge uh, LA is far larger than San Francisco, where she, she came from. Uh, he told me, Steve Cooley is his name, that, that uh, in the course of the campaign, his campaign manager said, you know, this is really not a race for attorney general. It's a race for vice president. And, and meaning that, that Harris was going to be at some point a vice presidential uh, nominee. Um, yeah, Cooley dismissed it. Um, you know, people underestimate Kamala Harris at, at, at their peril. Um, I think maybe Mr. Cooley uh, did a little bit uh, back then. Um, and sure enough, here she is. So you titled the book Kamala's Way. Why'd you title it that? Well, that was the great editor Priscilla Payton of Simon and Schuster who came up with the title. But I love the title, and the, the reason is that you know it's it's multiple meanings. I mean, it's it's Kamala's way, her path from Oakland to Berkeley to Montreal to uh, the White House. Um, uh, so it's her pathway, but then it's also her style, and her her, her style is 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 one that that we that that you know those of us who who saw her in action. Um, you know, she, she leaves an impression. She, she's, um, uh, you know, she walks into a room. She's, you know, she's not a large person. She walks into a room though. She's, you know, she's there. She's, you know, she's, she's got, you know, she, um, uh, well, she, she leaves an impression. She, you, you know, when she's around. How would you define her in one word? 
So I, you know, when, when I was working on the book, I was trying to think of, of, of who she is, what she is. And, and it's really transitional, right? She, she, she grew up, she was born at a transitional time, 1964. I mean, think what was happening then. LBJ is elected president. Um, uh, Willie Brown was elected to the, to the state assembly. Um, uh, that was also a year when California voters voted for an initiative that basically uh, upheld the right of, of uh, apartment owners to maintain segregated apartments. Um, so uh, that was ultimately uh, overturned by the California Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court. <clears throat> nonetheless, so, so nonetheless, it was, um, it, well, it was a transitional time. Um, and she's a transitional uh, uh, character in California politics. Um, you know, in 2010, when she won statewide, that was the year when um, uh, Democrats, you know, I mean, it was a huge year for Republicans nationally, but not in California. California really, truly became a blue state in 2010. Um, she barely won that election. In fact, on election night, Mr. Cooley declared victory, handed out pens that said Cooley Attorney General. Um, so, uh, so yeah, she was she, but but she represented a transition, and she's a transitional person as 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 vice president, transitional person nationally. Um, I, you know, I think that what happens in California, not always and not always for the best, sometimes uh, spreads uh, uh, east. And um, so I think that, that, um, that certainly on a, on a significant level, she is, she is a transitional person nationally. And maybe transformational is possibly being uh, the next president of the United States in 2024. Or 28, um, you know, again, I, I, you know, I, I understand that the conventional wisdom is that Joe Biden is a one-term president. He's wanted to be president for a lot of years. I think if his health uh, permits that, of course, he's going to run again. Um, why wouldn't he? Um, so, you know, like I say, she's young enough. She can run in for eight, 12 years, 16 years for that matter. Dan, thank you so much. I so enjoyed reading Kamala's Way. I invite everyone to go out and pick up a copy. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for being our guest speaker tonight. Thank all of you who have joined us this evening. I hope you'll consider joining us for the remaining programs in April with John Boehner and also at the end of the month with the president of the World Economic Forum. Thank you again, Dan. All of you watching, I'm Marianne Maldonado bringing you Global Conversations from all over the world. Thank you again. Have a great evening. Good Thank night. you very much, Marianne. Thanks Thank to the World Affairs Council. Thank you. Have a great evening.